the Earth is estimated to have lost about half of its shallow water corals in the last 30 years. And in fact, yesterday, just yesterday, the report came out that we might actually, this, this figure might be actually optimistic. We might be losing the corals in the recent years uh, the, the, uh, faster than scientists thought we were. 20% of the Amazon has disappeared, of the Amazon forest has disappeared in the last, in just 50 years. And, but globally, the nature, provi nature provides services worth about estimated $125 trillion a year while also helping ensure the supply of fresh air, clean water. So this $125 trillion is not even counting what we consider is the basic given water, fre uh, fresh water, air, um, energy, food, medicines, and much more. Okay? And the thing is that the, the fact that we only have data for four years ago is not even the, the, the sort of doesn't give you the scope of the dearth of information here. We don't have the basic data for even the numbers of most of the species, even the ones that we consider iconic. The African elephants, the ones that have, have been iconic recently in terms of uh, the fight against uh, poaching and uh, uh, species conservation on this continent, we don't have the numbers. The International Unit of Conservation of, Na uh, of Nature, which is the main body that determines conservation status of most species, when we say that the species are endangered, is because they determine the species are endangered. They are the authoritative body. When we say it's on the red list, it's the red list of IUCN. And so this, the, this is the information that they have about the status of the savanna uh, elephant, African elephant. Uh, that these are not numbers, this is just population trends. Right. We don't have exact numbers, and the, we don't even have the trends for Central Africa, for the species. Um, and it's not unique to African elephant. Orcas, killer whales, these species that everybody, like the, the everybody's favorite or unfavorite uh, whale. IUCN's status for that species is data deficient. We think it's endangered. We think that the situation is actually not good for the species, but it's, d it's designated as data deficient. We, that officially we don't have the way to say anything about its population numbers. Polar bears. Well, we think that the population size is vulnerable. The trend is unknown because we're not monitoring it. Whale shark. Even when the population numbers are known, here's this case where, where what do, wh when IUCN doesn't consider data deficient. What do we mean data not deficient? So, uh, the pop global population size was estimated in 2007 and 2009 uh, using uh, mitochondrial DNA, so the, to, to, to from a sample of uh, 70, 70 individuals, and based on their genetic sample, you estimate the, the genetic diversity of what the total population genetics should be like in order to give the genetic distribution of that sample, right? So from that, the population, the global population, uh, effective population size is estimated to be 103,572 with a standard error of 27,401 uh, to 179,794. So this is a very scientific way of saying we have no clue. Right, so this is the situation when technically we have data. And so out of the 80,000 or so species that IUCN tracks, species of animals that IUCN tracks, this is by far the most common situation. So how can we talk about conservation if we don't have the basic numbers? We ha don't have the way to even do the basic assessment. So evidence-based conservation, uh, conservation needs monitoring. And in fact, uh, we start, so this is a cycle of uh, uh, setting the goals, right? What do you want to accomplish? Uh, you need to monitor the resource. Right, for this is the point where you do you need at least the basic numbers to know what's going on. By the way, am I my microphone is on? Yes. Um, you analyze the trends, which means you need basic numbers over some number uh, some some period of time. Uh, you decide on management action. Uh, you then 
measure the outcome. Again, you need to monitor what happened after you decided on that action. Uh, did you did your goals? Did you achieve your goals? Great. You can update them or not. If not, you need to change your approach, right? And at every single point of it, or at least in these instances, you really need uh, good quantitative, not qualitative, quantitative uh, approaches. This is where uh, machine learning uh, th it can help. This is where good, w w where we can really do something. So how can we help? Or rather, how can we help? So as I pointed out, there are a couple of points that we, win, we can really come in. We can, uh, so getting the basic data is a big deal. It's hard, right? So the basic data on who or what, what, uh, what species uh, are out there of plants and animals, uh, where are they? And when do they show up there? So what is the habitat? What, is, what are the species? How many? What's the range? Uh, what are the changes, the dynamics of the species over time? Uh, prevent loss. So de uh, deforestation, poaching. Uh, we can focus on either detecting the legal activity, uh, deter, put deterrent um, uh, strategies in place, or help persecution by uh, identifying that the sale uh, was uh, illegal or the, the, the posting advertising, uh, advertisement on eBay, for example, was of illegal um, wildlife trade and so on. Uh, we can design efficient conservation management strategies. It's a wonderful area of uh, ML application. And then finally, we can engage the public by being creative and use uh, all the gamification and uh, ML and education kind of thinking that uh, we've, uh, we've had so far. So let's start with data. This is what conservation data collection still largely looks, but certainly was the only way until very, very, very recently. A lot of muddy boots, a lot of people in the field. Most of them look happy. They really enjoy this. But the problem is that it is expensive, it is dangerous bo for both humans and animals quite often, and it's hugely time consuming. So with the recent change in the technology, we have tons of very different kind of data. We have uh, camera traps, we have citizen science data, we have, uh, sorry, uh, videos and images of all kinds coming from remote sensing, we have, uh, uh, opportunistic data from various apps, we have uh, online data of all kinds, we have remote sensing, we have uh, uh, sensors that I already showed you yesterday um, that track animals locally at very high resolution or I think by far the baddest uh, way to, to, to the dino to track animals remotely is the European Icarus project, Icarus Initiative. Well, it's led by Europe, but it's an international cooperation for animal research uh, using space, which uses tiny active passive RFIDs on animals. So this is a tiny antenna right there on the bumblebee. Uh, this big. And an antenna that was mounted in August uh, on the International Space Station. You want to track animal, track them through space station, right? That's the way to go. <laughs> um, and sweeps the earth in these 500, um, 500 uh, 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 kilometer swaths buffer. Um, but you can have intermediate, you can have autonomous vehicles on the land, water, and air. Uh, we have uh, gen gen genomics coming in, which is all of this data together uh, is, is a flood like everywhere else, but it's a very different kind of flood. Because one, it's completely unharnessed. Two, uh, the models, that, uh, the models that, that biologists and conservation managers are using are completely unfit for this kind of data. There is not even the beginning of the matching of the assumption, assumptions. Uh, most of the data is presence-only data, which is very different than uh, uh, the, the models in machine learning are used to dealing with this kind of data. And it's actually, while 
large and dirty, noisy, and heterogeneous, it's actually not huge, huge. And so quite often, it's not big enough for a lot of machine learning uh, methodologies. But, so the challenge is, how can we go from the, all those data to insights, and more important, to actionable policy and deployed solutions? So I'll give you first an overview of, the, of a few players, a few examples in this space, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what the work that we have done and where I can go much deeper into the machine learning solutions um, approaches that we've, we've um, employed. So one of the, uh, recently one of the sort of big players uh, in this space, corporate players, and there are corporate players, but the biggest is uh, Microsoft, co-sponsor, um, but this is not uh, intentional. The uh, Microsoft announced at the Paris Climate uh, Summit the AI for Earth initiative, which uh, the goal is to change the way society monitors, models, and ultimately manages the Earth's natural system by empowering people and organizations to solve environmental challenges through technological innovation. So both by, uh, by uh, empowering the uh, researchers and engineers on the AI side, on the technology side, as well as bringing the, the matching with organizations that really need these solutions and providing them with resources to, uh, uh, to use them. So uh, uh, there are five dom uh, four domains that uh, uh, Microsoft focuses on. AI for Earth, uh, program there's agriculture so uh, solving problems to feed the growing world population water conserve and protect resources uh, biodiversity so monitor and protect species from extinction and the disclosure part here is that wild book wild me my nonprofit is uh, a flagship partner of Microsoft AI for Earth program in the biodiversity uh, part of the initiative and climate change reduce climate change change impact on um, communities and um, the uh, here's an example in the biodiversity uh, domain of the types of projects that Microsoft AI for Earth supports and so this is they're all over the world uh, a lot of them are in North America but uh, there are a couple here 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 um, and, uh, and even just sort of uh, scrolling, you can see the types of projects for casting and visualizing the fates of Earth species under climate change, can deep learning infer generalizations about species range shifts across hundreds of thousands of species. Uh, deep learning, deep time, microfossil taxonomy for paleontological community analysis, um, endangered killer whale medical records and health database. Uh, so this is, uh, trying to come up with approaches to automatically to do data fusion in this very weird um, environment. Climate change in uh, marine uh, biosphere uh, integrity, empowering citizen science for earth conservation and artificial intelligence, species detection from camera traps images. There are lots and lots and lots of very different kinds of machine learning uh, projects that, uh, that are in this space. So, to give a couple of examples, some of them are supported by Microsoft AI for Earth, some of them are not. Um, so here's an example, another also uh, organization that is supporting this uh, effort uh, and is related to Microsoft, <laughs> but in a very different way. So Vulcan is a philanthropic arm of uh, uh, the late Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, and uh, they recently uh, funded, uh, they founded the Machine Learning Center for Impact in Seattle, which is to, uh, the goal is to harness machine learning for public good. And biodiversity, again, uh, conservation is only one of uh, their foci. They're, they have others, including uh, education for low, low in, in low-income areas, and uh, which is also the investment from uh, uh, Bill Gates that was announced yesterday. Um, anyway, so the one of the, the w among the two major projects that they support in conservation is uh, Earth Ranger, 
which is uh, part of the domain awareness system, DAS, that they're, they're building, is software and data visualization platform for monitoring activity in defined wild park areas and particularly focusing on poaching prevention and, uh, uh, and protection from, uh, of uh, wildlife endangered species from poachers. So they, Paul Allen really, really, really loved the elephants and so they're, they're, they're focusing and starting particularly with elephants. And the other one, and this is following the Living Planet um, system, is the uh, survey is the uh, coral, building a coral atlas, right, providing data. Okay. So let's talk a, a, about uh, the couple of examples, actual examples of projects. So one example, it's very heavily machine learning uh, solution, is... Uh, from Conservation Metrics, is a little company in California that focuses on acoustic, acoustic uh, sensors, sensor networks uh, for ecological data uh, inference. And so, oh, and we're not going to sound <laughs> from here. I'll try to give you. So uh, they built a, a uh, deep learning system to detect and count wildlife events from acoustic sensors. So here's an example of an acoustic sensor that monitors, in this case, this big valley uh, for all kinds of sounds. And uh, uh, so they, 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 they take things that look like this. So this is a very noisy recording in different spectra. I don't know if you can see there is this really uh, uh, there, there are really data points all over the, like, across the entire spectrum here. And uh, uh, you can go this, uh, so they go the standard route. You do a whole bunch of different features. Uh, you do quite a bit of feature engineering with a lot of domain knowledge. And uh, so you get out of here is uh, sound clips that, uh, uh, in two second sound clips, they went with two seconds for their domain. Um, and you train them on different events and different uh, uh, species, and uh, sort of but and and sort them based on the the different spectral features and uh, find things like detecting rare or elus elusive species, estimating population trends, uh, measuring the outcome of conservation policy and impact assessment. So for rare species detection. Uh, their technology, this kind of technology, particularly theirs, uh, helped detect several species of uh, rare birds. Because these are, when you talk about sound, birds are probably the best example <laughs> of what you can detect. Um, and the breeding sites uh, for some of the birds, they found, um, so birds have characteristic Bird calls have characteristic signature, but you also uh, bats in different spectrum. They they're part of the African forest elephant uh, uh, monitoring project. So uh, the what they use to detect the presence of so the problems for savanna elephants are very different uh, in terms of counting and monitoring than for forest elephants. Forest elephants actually much harder to do through image uh, analysis uh, because they they're in very thick forests and you cannot do them from above from uh, airplanes or, or drones and so you really need to come up with different approaches and one of the ways that uh, people have started doing it very very recently is uh, to detect footsteps, elephant footsteps. So that's the sound. Right. Uh, and uh, so they do, using sound, doing population trends by uh, uh, going, uh, the by uh, listening, estimating the nest density over time. So actually counting the number of birds purely from the volume of the calls. And uh, so they've done it for several species and over seasons. And one of my favorite things, uh, examples, what, what you can do with machine learning in this domain is they've trained the, uh, to detect collision with, of birds with power lines. Okay. 
So here is what a collision of a bird with power line looks like, right here, this in the center. And let's see if we can actually hear this. Maybe not. Um. Let's see. That's not actually that's not what it sounds like. <laughs> and if um did you hear that? No? All right. power line collision. Hey. So another example of using, uh, using sound uh, as the input in this, uh, in this domain is from Rainforest uh, another um, nonprofit Rainforest Connection. What they do is they take your old cell phones and do send your old cell phones to them and they refurbish them with outfit them with these uh, solar panels and uh, put them on top of trees and rainforests to listen for, oops, to listen for chainsaw signatures of illegal, uh, of illegal uh, logging. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they claim that one device, one cell phone, so it's one cell phone, solar panels, it's not a working cell phone, it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't connect to the network, it just, uh, they use it essentially as a sophisticated microphone and data logger. And uh, so this one device protects 30 hectares of endangered forest and prevents logging f that would release 15,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. That is equivalent uh, to taking more than 3,000 cars off the road. So by sending one cell phone, by putting one cell phone out there, um, you you're you essentially equivalent to taking 3,000 cars off the road. Right, and uh, a very different example of machine learning approach uh, is uh, in, in the dom comes from a coalition led by University of Southern California and uh, the project called PAWS, the Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security. They focus, really focus on protecting animals from poaching and helping rangers uh, protect those animals. Um, with the uh, with the deployed, uh, so there are uh, 600 national parks w uh, that use smart system of monitoring around uh, th uh, that collects data about endangered species uh, and poachers around the globe. And so what they do, they take this data. Uh, and again, the standard cycle of uh, featured engineering, training, testing, prediction. Uh, and they focus on two problems. One is ranger allocation. Where should the rangers go so they're protecting the animals in the best possible way? So the thing is, with uh, elephants or rhinos, uh, highly endangered species, there are rangers in the parks that have them, but these parks typically are huge. If you had a chance to go to any one of the um, South African national parks or anywhere in the world, you know that typically these are big parks, um, and in the good case, and the there are too few rangers to cover the entire territory of the entire area of the parks, and they really cannot just walk around with the animals at all times to, to, to be present with every animal. Um, and it's a very dangerous job. Right? So ideally, there is a strategy that allocates uh, the routes, that generates the routes o of the rangers in a way that they can respond quickly if there is an accident, uh, incident, if there is a, um, a poaching event, right, or something happens. So uh, they've uh, focused, they've done this in a uh, couple of uh, parks in Uganda by uh, looking at features such as uh, distance to the road, distance to water, distance to river, land cover and so on, um, as well as history of poaching activity and uh, patrolling effort. And so by planning 
the routes, the patrol routes, uh, they, uh, they also incorporated constraints of the topography, so how quickly is it going, is it how you can get from one place to another to respond to poaching events, and uh, designed not only optimal patrolling strategies, but also optimal response strategies, optimizing, constantly optimizing, dynamically, um, taking the, the, the existing data dynamically into, into account. Okay. So there are also uh, now uh, a collection of responses that are starting to emerge in terms of the assessment of conservation, of conservation uh, strategies, of conservation policies, or design optimal uh, or design conservation policies. So, where should you allocate protected land, for example, ba uh, for uh, uh, based on the, the the habitat features and the human activity features, while taking the climate change predicted climate change into account, because typically these conservation uh, efforts are long term. You have to do them long term. Uh, the in again in the um, the efforts that are related to cr wildlife crime fighting, WWF, the World Wildlife Con uh, Fund, is leading the effort in using machine learning and more broadly AI to help fight online and digital wildlife crime. So. Google is leading the effort in finding, in detecting uh, for sale, s sale ads and uh, transactions of illegal wildlife products online. So they started with eBay, but this is now way beyond eBay. Um, there are efforts in uh, uh, forensic efforts. So when there is a, a, a trade of uh, of wildlife, in many cases, there, for example, um, birds in Brazil. There is uh, some birds that are allowed domestic that are bred uh, for sale, but uh, you're not allowed to sell wildlife, uh, wild birds. Similarly, uh, so we're involved in one of those efforts that um, is for geometric tortoises from Madagascar, star tortoises. So. Uh, this shell of these uh, beautiful animals is, uh, I mean, it's so beautiful that it's used for crafts and as artifacts, as beauty artifacts. And uh, each turtus on the black market is about $20,000. There are legacy artifacts that are allowed for sale, uh, but uh, new ones are not. But when people sell, they always claim this is an old one. So how do you distinguish between the, um, from just the pictures, whether it's an old one or a new one, uh, whether it's forbidden or allowed, things like that. When uh, there is a, when there is a, uh, the unfortunate event of a rhino or an elephant uh, poaching, can you take just the, and you typically, well, they typically just have parts of uh, the animal and, you know, can you figure out where this animal ca came from? And again, there are machine learning approaches that are being developed to, to, to deal with this um, and, and figure out whether, so essentially forensics, like fingerprint recognition of being part of the animal, what, where, where this animal is from, who is this animal, and, uh, and so on. So this is sort of just a very, very, very small overview of the types of questions that people are People are trying. Uh, people are answering using machine learning in this domain, and it's a, it's a, it's a nascent domain. P uh, there, there's just a growing uh, need, as well as a growing set of uh, people who are engaged in this. So let me give you a much more detailed one particular example. It happens to be my favorite, um, the Wild Book Project, that uses uh, images as the source of information about animals. So this is a uh, joint project. Co-founders include uh, Dan Rubinstein, ecologist from Princeton University, uh, Chuck Stewart, computer vision researcher from Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute, and uh, Jason Holmberg, uh, who's a data architect and now chief executive, uh, now an executive director of nonprofit WildMe. So let's start. 
So how many elephants are there? And how quickly are they being poached? The claim is that within 50 years, there will be no African elephants left in the world at the current rate of poaching. Of the estimated 30,000 elephants a year are being poached. 30,000. If we don't do anything, your grandchildren will not be able to see an elephant, a live elephant. Okay. How far do whales go? Or how many orcas are there, right? Um, how many hatchlings of, of, turtles, of uh, turtles survive to adulthood? I mean, we don't know the answers to these questions. I showed you, we have no basic data to be able to answer this. In fact, for elephants, Paul Allen's foundation put in $8 million a few years ago uh, and uh, two years to fly airplanes all over the continent to try to come up with a census with a number for the entire African elephant population. This is clearly not, and even then, the answers are highly uncertain. It's just the numbers are very uncertain so, and, and fuzzy. So, and it is an unscalable effort. It's not a repeatable effort. We cannot do this uh, $8 million investment uh, for two years to, to, to try to monitor the population. There are not enough GPS colors and uh, uh, scientists to follow any, every animal of every species at all times. Besides, these GPS colors or radio colors can be actually dangerous to the animals themselves right? that we're trying to protect. So. What's a scientist or a conservation manager to do? Today, one of the most abundant, readily available sources of information about everything, from your food to uh, the cute cat pictures, right? The, cu the cute cat expressions are pictures. Um, these are pictures, and it's the same thing for animals. So today, the most abundant source of information about uh, wildlife are pictures. These pictures come from scientists, field assistants, camera traps, um, and uh, drones on the uh, in the air, land, and water, as well as tourists taking their, vacation, their, their safari and whale watching pictures and posting them online. So if we could only really uh, use them, would be fantastic, right? So I'll let you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Right, so, so, and this is just the species. What if you want to do an actual individual? So we did it in less than five years. We did it in two. Uh, we built a system where you can take all these millions of photos that come from all of these sources. And not only, can you find all the elephants in these ones? Come on, come on. Okay, and, and take them and not only find the ones, all the pictures that have uh, animals and uh, figure out which animals are there uh, in those pictures and put a box around each one, including the, 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 the hard cases, like there's this baby elephant behind his mom or these occluded uh, zebras, uh, but and uh, uh, classify this not only down to species as an elephant, uh, well, savanna elephant, humpback whale, and uh, hawksbill turtle or gravy zebra, but uh, tell you that's Zippy the zebra and Terry the turtle and Willie the whale and uh, Ellie the elephant. So how do we do this? So now we can go in a little bit more detail. The problem with uh, using all these heterogeneous sources of, uh, of uh, pictures uh, for animals is one, you have majority of pictures come from amateur photographers. So, and you have overlap. So, how many zebras do you, do, do you see here? How many zebras are in this left picture? So, raise your hand if you think there's one zebra. Two, three, four, five, seven. <laughs> okay, there are four zebras in this picture. 
So here's one, right? You all see the front one. Uh, now, if you look at, if you start counting the, the, the legs, <laughs> there's right behind it, there's another four sets of, uh, uh, there's a set of four, uh, four legs. So that's zebra number two. Then if you look on the left, there's another couple of legs sticking out. So that's zebra number three. And then there is a head all the way to the right. There is a head sticking out of zebra number four. <laughs> right here, for those of you who can see my pointer, right? This is zebra number four. So there are four zebras in this picture. And even humans cannot do a decent job of, of uh, segmenting and counting the whole thing. So, and turns out that this state, uh, so that's one problem. Another problem is uh, the viewpoint. Uh, we can have the same zebra from all different angles, the front, left, back, and even uh, top and bottom. If you're flying a drone, that's from the top, but they occasionally go and do this uh, dust bathing, uh, which you, s you, know, you see them from the bottom. Uh, we have the problem of quality and lighting. Uh, majority of the pictures, in fact, are, uh, the technical term is crappy. So the you, you, you can have pictures that are too far in the background or obscured by trees, um, which is okay. Here's an, an example of what we consider an excellent picture. Right? Um, and there's also scarring and aging and pregnancy and, uh, and, and many animals actually change over their lifetime. So what do we do? We pose the problem as detection for identification. So this is not a problem of, here's the difference between the standard, every time we pose this, we say here's a problem that we have, we would like to have all these pictures of uh, animals and figure out who are the animals in those pictures and down to individual animal. So, ideas, come on, because I'm sure you have ideas. <laughs> what do we do? Is it a solved problem? Anybody? No. Okay, turn to your neighbor, figure out a solution now. Because <laughs> I'm sure there are, there are ideas that you guys can have. This is going to be an interactive hackathon. <laughs> mm. Mm. You have an answer? <laughs> mm. Okay. <laughs> I'm super excited to hear uh, to hear some ideas. So, yes. Excellent idea. Okay, Ilrik, you're on. <laughs> We're going to reconstruct the missing parts of zebra using generative model. Okay, so that's one suggestion. Uh, what else? Other ideas? So let's start easy. How do we take a picture and figure out that there is a zebra? By the way, did you realize this is a different species of zebra than the, the ones I was showing before? <laughs> so come on. The, the, I was talking about gravy zebras uh, for a while. Uh, they, well, they're these guys. So these are the endangered zebras. Uh, they're in, they're, most of them are in Kenya. The ones here, the similar species, are mountain zebras in South Africa. But uh, the zebras, these zebras, are, so the, they're the gravy zebras. These guys are the ones that you're thinking about, you know, going in thousands with uh, wildebeest and Serengeti and across the continent. These are plain zebras. They're not endangered. So, okay. So uh, if all I wanted to know that they're plain zebras in this picture. Do we have a solution? 
do I hear a solution? Come on. <laughs> How would you go about it? Your favorite method? Yeah. I'm hearing the right, the right answers. <laughs> yeah, there are plenty of uh, deep learning approaches that would do class species, class species level classification to figure out that you have a plain zebra in this picture, right? We can take, we can train this, and in fact, ImageNet uh, is a great data set. We now can recognize more than, I think, 50, no, 500,000, half a billion different species from um, just to say there is a plain zebra in this picture. But what if I wanted to do to separate them. Is that a solved problem? So to say, to, to, to say this is uh, one zebra, then there is uh, another zebra, there is another zebra, another zebra. So, so put sort of tight bounding boxes and count the zebras in, in, in this picture. Is it a solved problem? Reasonably-ish. I mean, we could do this again with enough training data. We probably could do a decent job of this. Although it's getting hard because we, uh, we have to make sure to construct the training set in the right way. Uh, because uh, a lot of what happens is a lot of the training data that, uh, that now has been used for this is from great pictures. From really good pictures. So you really need to train on hard cases in this case, in this domain. Um, okay, getting warmer. Now, what about... What about if I wanted to, to figure out who, uh, who is uh, each zebra? That this is Zippy the zebra, and Zane the zebra, and Zach the zebra, and Zoe the zebra. And it is, by the way, that is definitely Zach the zebra. <laughs> and that's the male, and that's the male of the species that, that you know, he announces uh, that this is his harem. And you know the sound that the male of the species make? The all powerful sort of, this is my harem sound? That's about the level. All right. So, so what about uh, figuring out who is who is uh, uh, who is each, who each zebra is? And I will pose the next challenge to you. What if you wanted to figure out that this is a baby and this is a female and she's probably pregnant actually? Uh, so, if you wanted to to, class, uh, to 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 give information about this image down to that level, that this is a baby from the left side, a pregnant female probably the mother of this one, uh, a male displaying uh, his, his uh, territorial dominance, that there is another one over there, that they're all probably females, and being able to sort of recognize not only individual, but also down to their demographic status and behavior, all from this picture. So we have lunch break right now. You're going to all come back uh, with the solutions to this problem, and then I will skip the rest of my talk because we will all have it figured out, right? <laughs>